Hey there, Adam. That is one great score. Really, really enjoyed looking at that and uh, listening to the mock-up. Actually worked pretty well in a lot of ways, except for one or two points that I'm going to help you with, in addition to a few other little points of feedback and balance and so on. So, <clears throat> before we dive into the... Um, into the different evaluation criteria, let's take a look at the role of the harp here. <clears throat> this is going to lead to a discussion, or it's going to touch on something I'm going to talk about more in detail. However, in a minute, but like, <clears throat> you can probably already tell by that mock-up that the harp is pretty much inaudible, right? So um, so you just really have to ask yourself, like, you know, if the mock-up is telling me that this doesn't work or that this isn't, you know, this doesn't sound, you know, balanced or anything, then it is probably not going to sound balanced in, um, in concert either because... If anything, the um, <clears throat> these mock-ups tend to idealize the balance, right? They tend to bring out the harp, or they, they tend to exaggerate, you know, the uh, how well you can he hear things like triangle and glockenspiel and, and celesta and so on. Mainly celesta. So if you can't hear the harp then that is really why. Now you've got everybody playing fortissimo and you are backing off your brass to a degree and so on. However, <clears throat> it's, it's sort of strange that you're starting mezzo piano in your winds but mezzo forte in your horns, right? So it should be the other way around, right? Sh or shouldn't your horns maybe start at piano and then push forwards? Okay, well I'll touch on that in a minute but you could probably hear that right in here you couldn't hear any of this very nicely scored out harp. And that is really going to be the same situation live. So like nothing here is going to be audible except for this glissando. And <clears throat> once again, all you need are the endpoints, right? All you need is the beginning note, the ending note, the glissando line. And then if you want the glissando to come through the mock-up on the right pitches, you get the harp, um, you get that, uh, harp glissando plug-in in Sibelius, and I think there are some other options in other notation applications. Okay, so <clears throat> that was just my first thoughts about uh, harp because I feel that um, I, th I think I just I just need to make this clearer in uh, in some of my kind of pre. <laughs> um, some of my my precautionary warnings because I, I feel like I'm spending a lot of time on it that you know that probably could be spent to better use put to better use so now <clears throat> let's um, actually before before we go to the uh, evaluation criteria I would just say like maybe if you had enormously huge gushing rolls right that some of that could come through but it still is pretty overbalanced, you know, in terms of the intensity of the strings and winds and stuff. It just would really be difficult to hear harp in there, even with big gushing rolls. <clears throat> Glissando will come in uh, pretty well. Um, if everything was backed off in sections like this and the harp was way above, you know, like uh, two or three octaves above, then you would, then that little figuration would come through pretty nicely. So now, for the evaluation criteria. <clears throat> so, we have that concern of pitch weight in the upper middle register of the orchestra. You're sort of spreading it around a little bit, but it's not really getting all that low. <laughs> right, like right in here, you've got a low E, right? And changing to a low D, sounding D. So, it, it, it is pretty much high-pitched. Um, and by that I don't mean like the pitches are high, but the the pitch it's almost like the like the way that the music is thrown onto the onto the canvas is high. So 
you, you know, you just have to ask yourself if that is, you know, do you want to realize um, uh, Faya's work in that, you know, according to that restriction, right, of, of really keeping it more or less where he scored in the piano. <clears throat> so if we go to the thematic material, we can see, like, yeah, it's, it, is, it is pretty much up there in that higher place right where the hands are sitting, and that's fine. Um, you did something similar to me, like you added trumpets below, right? Um, so, and, and you did change things ar around a little bit, like you're adding snare drum here and, and the, and the trumpets being a little bit, um, <clears throat> a little bit more out there than just going, yep, up, up, um, by the way, a uh, three is just, is just a lot of weight. You need, all you need is one here, right? Because it's going to, you know, a three trumpets, you are not going to hear any of these clarinets uh, or the English horn. And the overtones from the trumpets are also going to blot out to a degree the first clarinet and the oboes. And you'll hear some flute and piccolo. <clears throat> so I would say just use one trumpet and you will be fine. Okay, so here... You don't have to write one, two on top and three on the bottom, right? Because we wouldn't assume that the first player would be on the bottom, right? Uh, or the second player, necessarily. So, so I mean, <clears throat> if there's any kind of doubt about it, then you can mark it out uh, telling us who is in what position. But, you know, unless you are doing something unorthodox, then I would say you don't need to mark this out for the copyist or the conductor. They will know. Right. And then when you get to here, if you really intend to go back to A3, you would have to write it in again. So I would just say, leave this out, just score it as it is, as is, and then A3, and then so on, A3. <coughs> uh, if you're going to do A3. <laughs> okay, so, so I feel that like the the difference between these two sections, sort of, you know, kind of copy-pasted sections, is not quite enough, right, like, if to, to satisfy that criterion. I mean, I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm not saying that it it's bad taste not to do, not to apply uh, that concern, you know, that I did, but I'm just saying that's something to think about, right, whether or not, if you do take this further, and if you're going to treat this as a sketch and and go forward with it and try to get an orchestra to play it near you or whatever, then I would say like think about magnifying it the second time in some way that's a little bit more, and that and that could also lead to lower pitches or a broader pitch range. <clears throat> okay, so now let's talk about this concern of uh, melodic development and accompaniment figures. Okay, so it really is in the accompaniment figures that the problem is. And it's not because it's not because the accompaniment figures are scored wrong necessarily. Okay, it's more that the that this cushion in the background is really blotting out what's going on, in, you know, that sort of agile feeling <clears throat> that's in the music, that's in the piano music, that kind of leaping around uh, accompaniment that really gives it its energy and, and zest and pizzazz. Now, I've already talked about how the harp is going to be inaudible here against the this cushion. And I would say that the harp is really just doesn't... You know, if you're adding pizzicato into the mix, the harp is already going to be buried by that sound, right? So the this pluck here... Or excuse me, this... Yeah, well, this this pluck by this on the strings... <clears throat> and the the pluck here in the cellos and violas is going to pretty much bury this and then i mean and then just all the activity around it is going to make it hard for the harpist to collaborate in any meaningful way so maybe like the solution here is to just not have harp maybe not have harp at all except for this glissando um and then score this out amongst your middle strings Right, which you're kind of already doing when you get to here. <clears throat> and then, as to this cushion, I, as I've said before, it is really overbalanced towards the horns. You notice that this one, like second horn note, is just 
and and fourth horn note is just really standing out, you know. <clears throat> um, you know, E D E D. It just really, you know, it almost sounds a little bit like a, like a, um, like a very slow uh, French ambulance siren, right? So it really is cutting through and 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 overemphasizing the root note of the um, of the harmony there. <clears throat> and <clears throat> you know, on top of that, you you've also got um, you know, a similar, a similar motion in your English horn and your first clarinet. So, uh, it, I, I would just say just, you need to rethink this a little bit, right? And then you have this push from, you know, mezzo forte to forte, and there really isn't, you know, you, you don't compensate for that in the parts that are important, right? And, and also, it's just a little curious, like, Da, 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 ba, 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 ba. You see, here you've got uh, 30 string players in, in, in an ideal situation. Let's say you have four, uh, 14 f seconds and 16 firsts, right? So that would be kind of a standard large orchestra. <clears throat> so you've got all these players hammering away at this, all right? And then you come in with the flute and the piccolo right in here, all right? And then you're playing octaves here, oboe and piccolo. It's very effective. And you got this little rip here from the uh, flutes and the English horn, which you know the the flutes are not all that powerful right in here. They they are not really really contributing a lot, but you don't have a lot going on except for these horns hanging on. So the, the horns hanging on here is going to blot out the the this rip in the flute quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, it's not the hugest of concerns, but it's still something to think about. The English horn is fine, though, um, but still not ideal with this much power from the horns. The horns really have a have an intense sound, you know. Um, so I would just say, just maybe rethink this with the way that it is. But like back to the the treatment of the melody here, um, you're avoiding going too high, and and I I understand that and respect that, right? But there's no reason why the strings couldn't keep keep going because. One of the problems, so that, like I would say, the main problem that you need to think about overall in this score is follow through. Right, there are several sections where the um, <clears throat> where you're trading off from one group to another, and the trade off is not very strong going to the next group. So, so right here, you know, for instance, you you've got. 30 string players, as I was saying before, um, and then they trade off here just to a couple of wind players, right? And it still is just not strong enough. So that, and, and also, it's just a textural drop off, right? Just suddenly there would just be a very brutal drop off of the texture here, and then with the winds going on. Now, the way that you can keep the strings in the action is just to drop them down to the next octave so that they're doubling the oboe line. Uh, or you could have you can have it end on this high A in the first, and then jump to the low A in the seconds, and then they can both continue on with the oboes, and then the overtones from the strings will create the illusion that they're playing higher than they really are. Or you can start the, you, or you can do all of that with the firsts, and then start the second violins an octave lower, right? And then they they'll come right in to double the oboes anyways. So it's just a, just a bunch of different ways of approaching this, but um, I would just say that like the trade-off here is you know especially pushing to forte or excuse me pushing to fortissimo, there would just really be a drop-off. This isn't balanced in terms of the of the trade-off, right in here. Okay, so and then going forwards to the um, <clears throat> to this next part right in here. Um, what I would say is, like here, you are compensating for getting too high, but the problem is everybody is doing the compensation at the same time. So you can just really hear that, you know, da 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 da. da. So just really this drop down here. There, you know, you you do have one steady line going upwards like this. So that is that is one straight line, right from the from the A two flutes to the. Uh, to the piccolo, and I think you just you have to mark, you have to let us know. Like if you're saying Atu here, and then you have these written out because there's some slight variation, but then you don't need to do this here. Like this, this can just be, um, yeah, all of this can just be a single voice 
with the word Atu over it, right? So I just, yeah, don't waste your time. A lot, you know, time is precious. <laughs> this is, it's delightful writing out these scores and putting extra work into it and stuff like that. But like any time-saving device that you can use, use it immediately and incorporate it in, in part of your workflow. And then, you know, you don't have to be punishing yourself, <laughs> you know, um, so much. And, you know, the same thing here. You could have this all under one stem. And then here you have a... Just the same thing, just have one voice and say ah two over it, and then direct, go back to this, and then ah two again, right? <clears throat> All right. And now, there's, there's one strange thing, and, and, and I was wondering if there was some concern with offset here, because of the, um, like when you have second voice, um, when you have second voice grace notes in Sibelius, there's a tendency for the the grace notes to try to place themselves right under the the um, the principal beat and then have the have the principal beat for the second voice come in late right so I'm just wondering if that was part of the reason why all of these notes are offset and they're, they're not offset because of the grace notes they're offset actually like you actually told them to be offset I was looking at the uh, <clears throat> I was looking at it here right we can see you got an offset of five point negative five point eight one, right? So, anyways, I was just kind of curious about that, but I mean, it's not a big deal. It doesn't really make or break anything. It's just really kind of strange. This is something you would not want in your final score, or right? you want everything lined up, all the cardinal, all of the principal notes lined up with the little grace note before. So there, there are tricks about that. There are ways around it, but it really just makes your score a little look kind of weird otherwise. Okay. But, okay, moving on. <clears throat> so I would say just try to find a way to make this uh, more naturally uh, transition, right? So um, this could continue on all the way up to A, B, you know, uh, you could before you drop down. So I would just say try to make them not all drop down on at the same time, right? And that will keep things from sounding so droppy, right? So like just you know even though you do have this line on top here, the the sense of everything kind of going kerklunk right here is is pretty pretty powerful because they all drop at the same time, right? So to so watch out for that. All right, and then <clears throat> once again like the problem of the of the horns being very very powerful and here's where i would say like um you, you know just watch out about x uh, about excuse me about importing all of the um all of the articulation marks from the piano score you don't need every accent right there are some there are some balance problems that would work themselves out without the accents like like you just get rid of the accents here and there's no need for the tenuto marks either and then all of a sudden this balance is better or try dropping the horns into the background even further, right? So this having this mezzo forte, right? So just try some of those ideas on your own mock-up and just see if you can, you know, if things sound better. <clears throat> and this is all really fun. I like this. Yeah, it's great. You know, and then the answer. Dun, 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 dun. I love the trading off. I love the variety right in here. This is the point in the score in which we've got the concern about the upper middle register being too relentless if there's no textural contrast, and you're adding tons of textural contrast. Now, <clears throat> question is, like, whether you, you do want this severe of a changeover, right? da 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 in winds, and then all of a sudden strings, yep, up, 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 up. I mean, that, it's really great to have this kind of call and response kind of a thing. So, <clears throat> you know, a, a lot of people, I would say most most scores are, are when they are, you know, most entries that I'm getting, when they run into this kind of thing, there's a tendency to try to dovetail, right? So that's another thing that you could possibly be doing, like having the strings come in really, really soft on this bar. And then right here, like crescendo to forte, and then continue on for one bar, and then diminuendo to triple P. Right? And then you could have a beautiful, smooth transition where you, you started off in winds and you ended up in strings, and how did I get there? Right, 
Um, so that's something that you could do to really, really ease this transition or, or just, le just leave it really disjointed. But I would say the problem with the disjointed trade-off is this, right? So right here you have a disjointed trade-off where there was a lack of power going forwards, right? So, and, and, that, and that is possibly something that you could address or fix or whatever. So right in here, it kind of calls the listener back to, to that problem from before. So if you fix this problem, then this is not a, then this doesn't, it won't have that effect on the listener. Now here at B, we've got some similar problems uh, with the harp. But the thing is that it could work if just everybody tones the hell down in the other parts. So, you know, forte harp, even fortissimo harp here, right? When it when it comes in, it's doing great until about right here, like with the horns crescendo. Like horns tend to absorb the sound of the harp, and then right here you've got the poor harpist playing against the trumpet, and they've got no chance at that point, right? It, you know, you could. You could even have like the clarity between the parts and still not be able to hear the harp because of the just because of the overtones. However, I, you know, having said this, heavy brass and harp will work really, really beautifully if there is if the players are listening to each other, right? But but then that changes the entire context of what's going on in the orchestra. Okay. <clears throat> So let's talk about the evaluation criteria. Just really, really, you know, stay focused on this because this is a really great screen right here, Adam. I mean, I think, I think nicely done. It just needs some tweaking uh, in order for everything to be nice and audible. So contrast of color, breadth of texture in middle register scoring, you've done it, you've nailed it, right? Now, uh, maintaining differentiated roles in closely spaced melodies and overlapping accompaniment figures, highlighting inner voices. That is all functioning here and is doing well except for the balance, which I'll talk about as we go along, right? So <clears throat> if we are looking just at the at the different functions, like this is really, really great. It's so nicely done. I, I love the use of the marcato uh, accent right in here. I think that that's excellent. I, you know, and I mean, to a degree, you could be using that here because it kind of means the same thing to um, to some players. Like, I, I know some brass players who kind of hate the accent of staccato, and they just would prefer a marcato mark. Right? They, they kind of feel that that's that's similar enough. And then there are other players who feel that there's a there's a slight um, difference between the two, and they and they've worked that out. But, <clears throat> anyways, this works really nicely. Um, I think that. Seeing as we're at the beginning of a rehearsal mark section, then you should definitely remark your your um, dynamics here. So I'd say forte, and definitely put that in here. Don't worry about it carrying over from before. It's just a question of like when the the um, um, conductor turning the page and so on. So um, here. This is really nicely done. Uh, so you said, like you're really thinking about balance here, right? You've got your horns. Um, I would say like you probably don't need a four here. You know, just cut the cut one staff. A uh, two, uh, and and I would actually say, actually don't cut one staff. Just have the first and the third play this, right? I just I just released a uh, <clears throat> I just released a tip. Uh, over on Patreon, and I think I will share it with the um, with the wider community this weekend. And that is um, talks a little bit more about the roles of the first and third and second and so on, and like how to know when to to score which one where. And I would say like like here, first and third work better than first and second, right? It's just more like the the two brashest, most heroic players are are the ones that should get this kind of a thing. Right. And also the most control. <clears throat> and, you know, that way you won't overwhelm your English horn and, and like, because, like, right, you know, A4, there's no way that the English horn and the viola are going to make any difference here whatsoever. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, 
not to mention clarinet, but like with a with just two players, then there's more of a chance for these other elements to add to the color. All right, now this this is something I just kind of didn't understand. Like once again, a problem of follow through. You have your second bassoon coming in and your first coming in and so on, and that's all fine. But you don't have that for your cellos. So we have bassoon, bup bup, and then cellos, da 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 da, da and just so much more powerful right like once you add the cellos to it so it's okay to start the cellos back here right and i think that that would make this whole line more even and 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 more comprehensible to the listener right it's just like what does the listener understand when they are listening to something like this so um and and then this is really really well done see like you've got the cellos and the violas working together here and i see why you're bringing the violas in here so that you can grab this right here um, with the uh, with the cellos, so yeah, and then and then that kind of brings in the next question of keeping high interjecting notes from sounding too glaringly repetitive, right? And and I think that like this is so great. Like first you hit the, um, you know that first um, that first high E for this particular bar right on the nose and then you throw in this little extra <laughs> this little extra interval that's so fun okay but to jump back to the beginning like you know um dun 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 and then you've got this big pow rip, uh the first flute uh ripping up there uh to that and this is the first interjecting note right and then the second note is actually a kind of a little um, a little chord, and then the third note comes at the end of you know the the third bar from there, and then we've got those little intervals. So you you know you might think well after a while this get a little bit trite, but I think that the use of the xylophone and the context that you throw in here keeps it fresh, right? So like something that you did before puts the next kind of things into context and so on. So um, now we're getting into this section right in here. And so here's where like, like the scoring once again is, is really nice, but it is, you know, it is problematic. Okay. So the first problem is essentially like if we're, if we, continuing to use the context here of A2 horns, right? So that is just huge amount of power right in there. It's just really going to be scorching, even mezzo forte, right? And you can see as it is with a uh, note performer, it's playing back what you asked, uh, A2, not, not A4. So it's playing it back with that intense sound. And... Yeah, I mean, it's just a lot. It really is a lot. I think you could get away with just, like, one horn. Okay? And... <clears throat> so... Yeah, so so do the other parts have enough support? Um, this is an... Here's another kind of strange little thing, and that is that the... Uh, is that this, this line here appears to be ending on this kind of long B flat. B natural in the template. Okay, so it's actually B, right? Because here's the B and so on. A lot of people threw in the B flat. Okay, so um so ending on ending on B natural. And then like you the the problem is you're the the line actually ends on da 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 dum it's yep up 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 da da dum right that's the that so the continuity of the line um is is ending strangely in some of these things so i would say just like anybody who's running into this problem just rewrite your rewrite this so that there's less emphasis on this yeah if you if you're going to insist on putting b flat there there's less emphasis on the b um and then the line really ends together yeah, yeah, da 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 da
and then it just changes to da 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 right so it's like it's a it's a way for this this counter melody right to turn into an accompaniment style right it's but like when the accompaniment figure ends on the just on this you know questionable note of harmony then um you know then it just really emphasizes that one note and i mean that's that's a that's a fun that's a fun thing to do for some players and so on but yeah then we have the the, the added problem is that you know you've got your strings you've got your lower strings at mezzo piano um i'm not sure what the dynamic is intended to be right in here so it may be mezzo forte but like we don't have it really marked like there's no marking of what this is and then we got mezzo forte in the winds kind of throughout so i think that just you kind of need to tweak the dynamics here a bit so uh i wouldn't give you know i mean what if the what if the horn this sounds crazy but bear with me what if the horn were piano espressivo and it was a solo right and then you brought in the second horn here for the um for the harmony and then the same thing first trumpet like if you if you're not if the second voice is not going to interact with the first voice then you don't need the second voice uh the second voice bar rest at all right you just get rid of those all we need is the first okay so what if you what if this was piano solo and then like the the um the rest of the orchestra was just kind of doing its thing at mezzo forte try that in your mock-up and see what happens Right. I like I like this the the timpani interaction with the um with the lower strings and so on. I think that that is just beautifully done. I think that it has that this wonderful kind of um you know, kind of very very uh very active, very primal kind of a sound. So yeah, um I mean, it's kind of fun to have this, this, um, the, the triplets above, right? But you, you, you could sort of, you could sort of hear how the, the horns were, were even inhabiting those overtones, right? Just at the, at the way that this is all balanced. This is really fun right in here. But, you know, once again, like, like, so if, if the, if the horn is playing really softly and everybody else is backed off, Maybe there's a chance for the harp to come through, right? And this is really kind of fun, the octaves right in here. But it's got to, it can't be too, you know, it can't be too strong, but it's still, you know, it still does what it needs to do. And that takes us to C. <laughs> and the problem here that I've got, or the concern that I've got in my uh, evaluations is... Uh, in my evaluation criteria is convincing Alargondo expansion, smooth release into bar 49. So I think that the conductor <laughs> can manage the smooth release that you, that, you know, from what you have written here. And actually the um, uh, note performer <laughs> and Sibelius do actually a fairly good job of that. And you've got the harp kind of glissandoing up as well right here and that that all sort of provides a nice kind of lift and 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 placement you've got the flutes above and I, I think this is just real fun the way that you hang on to every note just as if it were pedaled that's exactly the right thing to do but with the the overtones kind of hanging on above that's so cool you know, like, I'm really picking apart their score, but it doesn't mean that there aren't really great sections to it, great parts of it. Uh, and it doesn't mean that it wasn't uh, orchestrated well. It's just, uh, you know, if Adam could orchestrate perfectly, he wouldn't need to send me this score. So, you know, this is just my chance to help him. All right. So, yeah, once again... If it's going to be all first voice, you don't need the second voice, right? You're already telling us this is first voice, so you completely do not need the second voice bar rests. You do need them here, right? Because you're, 
because you're going back and forth between two different voices. And this is very, very clear for the conductor and the copyist and so on. But right, right here, it's just unnecessary. It's just cluttering up. I mean, it's forcing the, it's forcing the stems and the and the um, slurs up into a place where they take up more and more room. So, convincing all Argondo expansion, you handled that pretty nicely. You know, once again, I'm just going to say all you need are just the endpoints and a glissando line. And if you want it to come through your mock-up, then use the Harp glissando plugin, and it'll insert all of the glissando notes in any tuning that you like. And then just leave a uh, leave a harp pedal diagram at the beginning of the glissando, right? And then the harpist will just assume that's the default all the way through until they see another one with a different glissando or a different tuning for the beginning of a new passage. All right, so <clears throat> this is really fascinating to, fascinating to me, and that is how people chose to interpret the accompaniment pattern. So keeping the accompaniment pattern from being too regular and therefore predictable, you did that really, really well. Like you've got all these different things in here. You're really changing the context. You're adding different voices. Like it's you're adding clarinet after a couple of bars. You've got Colenio in there. And then you change what you're doing right in here too. So but I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So like as to the efficacy here, uh, Divisi, Sul Ponticello, that's all working fine. So the, the only thing is that Colenio is such a similar sound to marimba that, you know, it almost is like kind of why not use marimba here, right? You just get a, you get a much firmer stroke rather than the, the sound of Colenio, which is, which is pretty wimpy. You know, it's, it really is underpowered. People are astonished by the effectiveness and, and you know, of, of the opening of Mars and there, and, and then they'll, use the Colenio patch on their, um, you know, on their sound set and so on, and they'll just be thrilled by it. But then in actual practice, the Colenio is very, very, very soft. Uh, and the only reason why you are hearing it so loudly in Mars is because every string player is hammering away at a G somewhere. Like, a, like uh, the I think the violins, like all 30 violin players plus 12 <clears throat> viola players are all playing the same G and then an octave below that you've got the cellos and an octave below that you've got the basses, right? So, so the, um, you know, when you have that kind of weight, you do hear it, but if you just have like your cellos, it's, it's not going to be all that loud. I mean, it, it'll work here. What you've scored here will work, but it's just, you know, it's essentially a very same, a very similar sound. If not, if not kind of trying to be the sound of the marimba, right? So if you've got the marimba, why not use it? But then I understand why you didn't, because you, you want the marimba to come in here and be a fresh sound. So I let you get away with that. But, you know, if you do have a marimba and you're not trying to do this contrast, don't even bother with the colenio. Just give it to the, you know, give it to the marimba player. All right. Um, so... So, you know, we've got finger symbols, castanets, that's all works great. This is kind of strange here. Like, you've got your unfinished, um, you know, this, this is not a thing in string scoring, okay? If you want, if you want this to end on the eighth note, on the eighth value here, then just write in the eighth value. That's a, that's a thing in some uh, film scoring especially, and it's sort of seeped its way into concert music from time to time as well, and that is like really, really trying to get the players to finish right on the beat rather than to finish just before the beat. And, you know, when you do that, you end up messing around with how a player wants to shape their notes, right? It's sort of almost an exaggerated release. Um, the sustain lasts a little bit longer than the players are, are used to or are comfortable with, so you just have to deal with that you know, that you're, you're putting more pressure on them. Okay, but otherwise this works. It's really nice. I really love the oboe solo and the little piccolo coming in on top of it. Now, what you have to be aware of is, of course, that the pungency of the oboe is going to absorb, like its overtones are going to absorb the sound of the piccolo to a degree, especially as the piccolo descends into its weakest register. Like, and you end on the on one note higher than its weakest note, which is E, right? The lowest, the weakest note would be D. So, you know, you really are just adding some sweetening above. And if that were the intention, that's great. 
I like this here. You just have this little timpani roll on the A. So this is all great. I just really, really like this a lot. And then, of course, ending with yup, bum, 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 and so on. That that all works nice. Uh, and then this little answering uh, sinister note from Biam from your horn. The only problem I can see here is that, like, the pressure here, bum, bum, these chords in the um, trombones going to the trumpets. Uh, it, you know, it just could be enough to um, to overwhelm what the harp is doing here. So I would actually put the fortissimo sign here, fortissimo crescendo, right? And then you'll be able to hear this. I mean, but just like the way that it's set up, really, which is just like a timpani stroke, even at mezzo forte. And, and then and then here, of course, you, you also have got accented tenuto, right? So that 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 further kind of uh, obliterates what the harp is doing. Give the harp a bigger sweep, maybe start two octaves down. So you're covering way more notes. Like, you know, a, a really short glissando, like, um, that's not the right way of putting it, a very, a, a glissando that doesn't, cover a lot of ground, like in this case two octaves, is a little slower and droopier and is a more of an elegant effect, right? But what you want is a big sweep. Yum! Right? So start a couple octaves down and then just like the harpist will just rip through. It'll come out and then just mark it stronger from the beginning. And then it'll be a better uh, transition. Just try that out with your mock-up. You know, just stick the fortissimo here. And maybe take away, you know, you don't really need that, that many, um, you know, say one or the, one or the other, either the accent or the tenuto. Now here, this is really, really clever, but uh, the problem is that A2, you know, A2 trills um, on, on horn. I, so it's, you know, it, it is a, I like the this fancy schmancy. Um, uh, it's really hard to see with the resolution of some screen, so I'm going to um, I'm going to zoom in here. So yeah, so built right into the <laughs> but right into the line half step trill. Very very cool. All right, uh, so you, you know the problem you're running into here is you know a. Yeah, the, the first thing is that your clarinets are going to be overwhelmed by your your horns. And, you know, at A2. So I'd say, like, if you just had one horn player and one clarinet player, or maybe one horn player and two clarinet players, then I think that I think you get a better balance. But, you know, the way that it is really is, like, especially a horn trill just really sticks out in the music very fiercely. And, and it kind of... Like the, all of these other beautiful little elements that you've got, the marimba and the um, this you know this little busy stuff here in the uh, in the trumpets and so on, that will just really get overwhelmed by the you know this kind of garish horn trill. Horn trills are a little bit like you know you know a um, a big fat guy like me in their underwear running down the street. Um, you know, with a with a big circle painted on their tummy. You know, it's like it's you know, it really stands out. <laughs> it's something that you see and go, "Whoa!" I wish I hadn't seen that. Right? I mean, it, maybe not that bad, but it's just really, you know, it really pr protrudes into the music. So I would say, just say, see if you can back this off. A two, I think, is is not really doing it. Right? So you know, maybe one horn. You know. One horn, and just experiment a little bit with the with the balance there. See, like if one horn at mezzo piano gets you the right effect, right? And the same thing here. All right, but this is all really cool. And marimba, that's nice. This is kind of fun in here. Yeah, you have to think though. This like that. This is this is something that the uh, that no performer idealizes whether or not the marimba sound is. Um, is actually contributing, you know, it's like, is it, will it be something that's, that is easy to hear? And I have a tip about this comparing the, 
um, the harmonic spectrum of xylophone versus marimba. And in the case of the marimba, it really is a different waveform. It's a, like a, it's a waveform that has overtones that are built on the octave. And the xylophone has overtones that are built on odd numbered partials like a clarinet. And that's why it stands out. So you know, that's why it has a kind of more piercing sound. All right, and then this is lovely right in here. And with a little uh, tremolo at the end. Very, very fun. Of course, and you're, and you're backing that up with the uh, flute family from above. And just you know, and once again, like you're, you're varying your accompaniment pattern. And that's very cool. And then we're heading to this, managing the sense of restraint leading to a burst of energy. You totally do that. You totally get that in here. That's great. Da, 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 ba, da, um, with uh, with flute and um, and violins, maybe it doesn't need to be all the violins playing at once. Maybe it could just be first violins. And then right in here, this lovely contrast of of um, of melodic texture. Ba, 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 da, um, with piccolo, oboe, and uh, the bassoon on the bottom, that's all real great. Yeah, you're barely doing anything with your bass clarinets, though. What if this were bass clarinet on the bottom rather than, uh, than bassoon? And then the answer. Yeah, so just so cool, the, the way that this is all scored. I love the horns. It's perfect. It's really nice the way you back off. Uh, I think there may be one or two wrong notes in here. Uh, you might want to check that out. I think the first note here is maybe wrong. I love the use of the bass clarinet right in here. I think I did something similar myself. And it's ending on that low note, right? And then the roll. This is all so cool, right? You got that low C sharp in the double basses and the uh, stop notes in the in the horns first and third. Yeah, just very, very effective right in here. And oboe, right, instead of solo trumpet. And yeah, this is all nicely done. It's the, the stopped horns. I'm wondering if you could also have muted trombones right in here, right? That, but I mean, the way that they're scored right now sounds fine, at, you know, mentally, and also in your, in your mock-up. So you might not want to mess with it, but I'm just wondering, like, if you want to match the sound of the the sort of snarly sound of the uh, of the stopped horns with um, muted trumpet maybe instead and then yeah then just like you know oboe being answered by english horn an octave lower yeah so i mean yeah and then this all works great so i so, you know, just really such a fun score I, I mean i wish that i had the time to to go over the entire thing you know but you know, maybe like it would be worth it next year to support at a higher level and do the entire score. Like next year's score, I keep saying this, is going to be something really remarkable and different from anything that we've done. I mean, there's going to be, a, there will be one or two elements of things that we've done before that will be similar to it. But it's going to have at its heart a um, one fundamental orchestration problem to solve. And it would be interesting to see how everybody chooses to solve that problem. It's something that almost can't be translated from a solo performance to an orchestral performance. So I'm really setting the bar high with that, but it is one of the loveliest pieces of music. So it would be really great to see how you handle that, Adam. So it was a really great score. You know, I, I picked it apart and I feel that, that this is the kind of score that you could sit down with an orchestration teacher and spend three hours just on on the part that we've already talked about. There's a lot that I left out that I wanted to say more about, but you know these uh, <laughs> these uh, dotted semi-brev lectures are kind of turning into hour-long escapades, right? So I'm just thinking to myself, wow, that's maybe this maybe this excerpt or maybe this uh, selection for this year was a little long, and that's you know sort of pushing all of the evaluations kind of way longer than I expected, but I'm really enjoying it. It's not, it's, it's, I mean, it is more effort. I'm not going to deny it, but, um, but I'm just enjoying myself. It's not a, it's not, uh, 
drudgery or anything at all. It's just really, really fun. So just making sure that my voice doesn't give out, right? That's the, that's the main problem. And my energy levels stay up. So I will thank you for that, Adam. I'll thank you so much for that and for your uh, and for your support on Patreon. It really makes a difference. And to all the supporters who are dropping in and making comments over there on Patreon, some on Facebook, some on YouTube, depending on... I'm, I'm trying to encourage people on Facebook um, to leave comments on YouTube if the... if the... Um, uh, entrant is not a member of the group, right? Just, just you know, because it doesn't really make any sense to, you know, to have a comment on Facebook where it can't be read by the person who did the score. So, so in those cases, I'm trying to trying to encourage people to leave the feedback on YouTube or on Patreon if it's a if it's a Patreon entry. So anyway, so thanks for that. Thank you so much to all the website subscribers. Uh, you know, you guys are really kind of like the beating heart, right? Um, or the engine, I would say, be, would be, a, a, you know, more like you guys are spreading the word around and bringing in new people into the community who really have their act together uh, and who can help out others or who need a little help with their work. So it really, really makes a difference. I really appreciate it all. Um, and I'm ne I'll never get tired of thanking you guys. So I hope you won't get tired of me saying it. So with that, on to the next evaluation for me.